recording with Theodore Ted Murphy, a longtime resident and a prominent pharmacist in Lafayette. Also present is his wife, Linda. This tape was recorded on November 29, 1976, by Angela Broadhead of the Lafayette Historical Society. Ted, when did you first come to Lafayette? In August 1947. Linda, are you a, a native of Lafayette? I am a Nevada native. <laughs> uh, Ted, how did you happen to settle here? I had sold a store that I had in Nevada and uh, was working down at Pacific Grove and I heard that the Jewel Pharmacy in Lafayette was for sale. So I made a bid on it through the Board of Trade and arrived in Lafayette. First I came up and looked the store over and decided yeah. I wanted because I always favored a prescription type store. And this was a cute little hospital type fixtures and everything it was all cream white and uh, lots of drawers and things, not much merchandise display. So I decided to come to Lafayette, so we made a bid on it and got it. Oh, that sounds like it was a very nice pharmacy. Uh, exactly where was it? Uh, you said the Jewel uh, Pharmacy. Where exactly was it on, on Mount Diablo? And it's next door to where the Wells Fargo Bank is now. Uh, Kenneth Bone has his insurance agency in the building at the present time. So that was, uh, and what was on the corner then at that time? Nothing. Nothing. It was pear a vacant orchard. lot. A pear orchard. And then, of course, there, there was, was Happy Valley was there was already. There. And a, was it a dirt road then? Mm, yes, I it's think it was when we first came here, yeah. although it may have been paved just before or just after. I can't yeah. quite remember that. There was lots of dust that flew off, but I know that. <laughs> Were you the only pharmacist in town? No, there was two other stores here. One ran, was run by a man by the name of Richards, who had another store in Berkeley, and the other was by Maurice, or better known as Mort Sparling called his place the Lafayette Pharmacy. Uh, Richards called his Richards Pharmacy, and mine was called Murphy's Valley Prescription Pharmacy. Yes. And I know that your pharmacy was a very modern pharmacy. Um, if I were coming in the front door in 1947, would you describe it for me, please? There was two small glass cases, which would be opposite to the way you would walk in, and a, a rather a wide aisle on each side of these cases. They were small cases, that is not the big ones, about four feet, four and a half feet long, and 34, 35 inches high, all glass, both front and back. And uh, then you came forward, and the uh, counter, wrapping counter, service counter, was a rounded oval shape on the front, square across the back, and had a 30 inch or so aisle behind it. As you face this counter, to your right, there was a little alcove, and in that alcove was uh, greeting cards and uh, some school supplies very few, uh, vitamins, mineral capsules, all that type of thing, both for adults and children. To your left as you came in, along the west wall, there was uh, first 20 feet or so, but it's all shelving all the way down to the rear of the store, but about 20 feet from the front on each side, there was a space about 20, 24 inches wide with mirrors in behind and lights up above, which made a very attractive appearance to the store. Then to continue back to where the prescription counter was, that was came straight across from behind the register and the wrapping counter, curved around in a gentle curve 
parallel to the wall, went back about five or six feet, and then came into the area where the prescriptions were filled and where the prescription stock was kept. Uh, the ceiling had a step down all the way around the side, came down about to 18 inches from the ceiling or 20 inches, and that came out to the where the wall cases were. So you didn't have an, any shelf above the wall cases. The ceiling was made that way. And it also was contoured at where it met the ceiling so that you had the uh, impression of a nice round area or a nice round section going up to the ceiling and meeting the ceiling and joining it. Really made it very, yes, that's very, very nice. That's very attractive. Yes, it sounds very nice. Oh, I fell in love with it when I, I first saw I it. I can see why you did fall, fall in love with it. It's uh, very attractive, and you described it so very well. Linda, did yes, you uh, work in the... Oh, and you had... Uh, what did you say, Linda? Red fluorescent I, I Will you speak up a little louder? Because I don't think we caught that. You say. Oh, you spoke about the fluorescent lighting? Yeah. Yes, we had fluorescent lighting completely through the store. Uh, one thing I did not mention was we had a back room, an area back there for storage, and we had, later as our business grew, we had uh, filing cases back there for filing our prescriptions and also to carry additional prescription stock, which became necessary as our business grew. Yes. Uh, also, there was space further behind that. This was all storage space. That uh, old things like cases of Kleenex and baby pads and all that type of merchandise that takes space to keep in storage, because the store was small out front. There wasn't room for... About how wide was it out front, would you say? Um, 17 feet, I think yes. it was. 16 and a half or 17 feet. And about 35 feet deep to the back wall. And then the storage space was behind that, another 25 or 30 feet. Yeah. Now, when you came in 1947, what would you describe as a typical day for a pharmacist in uh, Lafayette? When I came... This is right after the war now. When I came in 1947, uh, as I said before, I bought this store up from the Board of Trade. And uh, business w was practically non-existent when we first opened. I think the first day in the store we took in like something, $35 or practically nothing. And that was mostly people curious dropping in, I think. But as time went on, it gradually grew and at the end of about three years, three and a half years, we had a very satisfactory business there. And you said you, uh, your primary business was in... Was in prescription was business. Was in prescription business. That's what intrigued uh, you the that's most. That's one thing that made it difficult when we bought it up from the Board of Trade because people were afraid we might go to the Board of Trade ourselves. Well, I don't exactly understand what that means, Ted. Well, that means the store has gone broke. They can't pay their bills. Oh, see, I... And I the wholesalers see. have this group that they call the Board of Trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, they turn their bills all over to the Board of Trade, and the Board of Trade has legal authority to make a demand upon the person that owns the store oh, that I he see. straighten out his financial affairs or they'll take over the business. Now I understand. Uh, Ted, did you make deliveries um, from your store in, uh, in 1947 and on? Yes, we did. In fact, we were the only store east of the tunnel who did that sort of thing, get out at night, fill prescriptions, and deliver medication to the people that needed it. Well, and that included uh, Arenda, Lafayette, Walnut Creek, Concord, Alamo, Martinez even. We had people come from yeah. over there to get prescriptions filled. That's a big this, area. After the stores were closed. I myself was closed, but I would get out and take care of them. I think that sounds like a true... Oh, it was hard working. 
pharmacist. Uh, <coughs> we pioneered Angela. Yes, tell, yes, tell us. Yes, I did help. Yes, we lived above us. the store, and I made the deliveries when we had to go out to deliver. We made many a good customer and many a good friend out of our little pharmacy in Lafayette. Yes, I can see how that would uh, be a very important um, part of your of your business. Right, uh, it was very important. And very yes, very important to the community. I, I, I can see that. How many doctors, Ted, were in town? Uh, Doctor Filer, Doctor Giroux, Doctor Orndorff, Doctor Jennings. It's hard. Dr. Vizard, and that, I think, is all. Where were the offices of some of these uh, doctors that you just mentioned? Uh, Dr. Orndorff and Dr. Jennings were pediatricians, and their offices were over in the upper story, over where the Sun offices are now, in the William Gordon building on Mont Diablo Boulevard, just above Cape Cod Restaurant. Dr. Bizard and Dr. Filer's offices were on Moraga Road, where Dr. Filer still has his office and owns the building. Uh, was Dr. Giroux Dr. on the boulevard? Dr. Giroux was in a white house next to Mrs. Jenny Bickerstaff's house, where the uh, Diablo Foods is now. That me leads me to uh, to um, interject here. Uh, did you know Mrs. Uh, Bickerstaff Rosenberg, Mrs. Jenny Bickerstaff mm. Rosenberg, at that time? Yes, we met her immediately. How did you happen to meet her? They came in to see us. They were such nice people. I think that we enjoyed uh, Mrs. Rosenberg so much. In fact, the first New Year's that we were here. She and Bill came over to our house, our apartment, which is in the building where the store was, and uh, brought a gallon of cider and cake. Mm -hmm. And we had coffee, cake, and cider with the Rosenbergs, the first New Year's celebration we had in Lafayette. That sounds like in a very nice. In 1947, this was, 47, 48, this would be. A nice celebration. What's 47? Well, the end of 47 and the start of 48. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, were drugs hard to get, to get back to uh, our, the doctors uh, and your pharmacy? Were drugs hard to get uh, during wo right after World War II? Uh, there were many shortages. Principally, uh, do you uh, remember? Paper some? products of practically all kinds, although they began to loosen up within a year after we came here mm -hmm. so that we could get Kleenex and uh, that type of paper product which was uh, almost non-existent the latter years of the war. Mm -hmm. Toilet paper, Kleenex, they didn't have paper towels those days, they hadn't come out yet with those. That sort of thing was very short supply, napkins of course, uh, nothing like the ones we have nowadays that are so soft and nice pleasant to use, you know. Those days they were rough. And uh, as far as the drugs were concerned, we had a twice weekly delivery out of San Francisco. One company, McKesson, Langley and Michaels. The other company was Coffin Reddington and Company. And twice weekly they sent a truck out, sort of a van type of truck with deliveries of the merchandise that we would send in and phone in and send in on order. Now, so did they come over the, they would come through the tunnel, of course. Oh, yes, the Bay Bridge and then the tunnel. And they delivered all through this area. All the towns that I mentioned before were all Danville, Alamo, Walnut Creek, Martinez, Concord, Lafayette, and Arenda were all handled, that is, the deliveries were handled with these people. And, um, Ted, if uh, you couldn't fill a particular prescription, was uh, was Linda delegated to go after? Maybe you can tell us, Linda. Did you go after the? <coughs> yes, uh, I had to go into Oakland, a wholesale house, to pick up 
what he needed to fill that prescription. And many, many times, se several times a day, oftentimes, she would Rain do that. or shine, it didn't matter. And Did you that, really? You mean you just couldn't pick up the telephone and say, uh, send out no, such and no, such? No, you had to have that medicine for your customer, and you wanted to take care it. of your customer, and you were, I mean, they were, you know, you had to do this sort of thing. You were. And that's you how we built great, our business. Uh, this was through those hard years. Yes. We pioneered. We were all pioneers here. <laughs> yes. uh, this particular company that we would pick these specialty items up, pharmacy items, prescription items, was called East Bay Medical Supply Company. And they specialized in that particular field. Oh, that is most interesting. You know, t um, what would you say then, w would you say then that the delivery, uh, the accessibility of of, um, of drugs and materials were the the main problem. That was a very serious compared problem. Compared to sometime. today, compared to today. Today, there's no problem. The East Bay Medical Supply has a place out in Pleasant Hill. Uh, Coffin Reddington is now in Oakland, out near the airport. Uh, McKesson has several warehouses in the area that uh, if one doesn't have it, the other does have it, you know. So there's no, no lack of merchandise and no shortage of any particular item. Those days it was entirely different. And of course this twice a week delivery made it very hard on a store like ours starting out with a small stock and gradually working it up because uh, twice a week just wasn't enough. If somebody was sick, they wanted the medicine within a reasonable time. How long would it, have, would it take you then to go into Oakland, Linda? Mm. 45 minutes, more? I mean, the, the road was not... Uh, yeah, I'd say a, a good hour. To, to go and in, mm -hmm. to and from? Yeah, an hour, about an hour. About an hour. Mm -hmm. Cars were... I, I would think down. a little longer than that, Linda. I think an hour in, an hour out, many times, because, see, we, the tunnel road those days came down to Broadway. You went all the way down Broadway and all those stop signs. If you hit the stop signs, it didn't take you near as long, but if you didn't, and we had this warehouse is down uh, um, 20, 22nd Street, I think it was. It's There's a church on the corner near there, and the the road forks out and one goes up past Pill Hill where all the hospitals are. And it was in that area, close to a, a garage that, that's there. Been there many, many years. Well, uh, Ted, uh, that would lead me to ask uh, you, would you describe the business district when you came to Lafayette? Uh, tell us about some of the other merchants who were in town. You told us that there were two drug stores. Now, Three drug stores. You made the third. The third, yes. yes. And there were two others. Now, what, uh, what were some, who were some of the other merchants in town? Uh, right next door to my store, maybe it'd best go back up to Cape Cod. Yes. Though those days, it was not called Cape Cod. It's the curve. It was called the curve. And uh, the building, basically the same as it is today, excepting that they didn't have the fish things on it. This was a chicken and dumpling place. So uh, was it, was it elegant and, or was supposed to be just a sort of a quick? No, quick it, it was a full dinner place. They served these chicken and dumplings with fresh biscuits, homemade biscuits. And people by the name of Sollers, S-O-L-L-A-R-S, were the owners and operators of this. In fact, I still see Mrs. Sollers, well, I haven't for a year or two. Her name was Marge, and she was an excellent cook and supervisor because she also was the major D and everything else. I think I've heard of Marge, yes. yes. Uh, someone else was telling us about uh, some of the restaurants in town, So, I, and she was a very... Uh, very well known. Yes, very well known. And then come down to the building where my store was located, 
Next door to me, there was a flower shop ran by Jory, J-O-R-Y. And there's still a Jory's flower shop, either in Walnut Creek or Martinez, I think maybe both. Walnut Creek, I do know. Mm -hmm. And next to him... There's a pet shop. Well, first... Saddle shop. No, first uh, next to him was uh, Ed Carey had oh, an insurance say. office. And then next to the insurance office was a saddle shop where they carried boots and saddles and ropes and all the things that tax, tack materials, as the uh, horsemen call it. Yeah. But we don't have one today. I should think there would be a need for one, but there isn't. Oh, really there is. Some not in Lafayette. Some well, or... I think we do have now up the street next to Diamond K, or just past there, between... Well, just past the Diamond K, there is a place that sells hay, and I think they probably sell tax supplies there. But that has just recently come in, in the last six months. Mm -hmm. But to come on down the street, why, uh, where the Lafayette Federal Savings and Loan is now, was uh, ALSAM, A-L-S-A-M. Uh, Continental type restaurant. Nightclub. Nightclub. Had entertainment in the evenings and uh, good orchestras. Lafayette really in those days had some of those wonderful orchestras. In fact, yeah, they yeah. did up until about the late 50s. Well, when, you remember when Scobie and his group used to I play there? I do remember. That, yes, that was about the end of the good orchestras mm -hmm. in Lafayette. But up to that time, all through the years, they had these things. And Danny Van Allen? It wasn't Danny Van Allen, though. That was El Molino. Yeah, well, wait a minute. We're getting ahead of ourselves. The fish market was there as practically as it is today. Some changes. Tunnel Inn was there. And it was run by a man by the name of Gush Schwartz. G-U-S-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. Is that where... Uh, That's where the guitars, the guitars is, guitars is now. Is now yeah. uh, then later, his mater D, Jay Bedsworth, took over the restaurant and ran it for, well, I guess, 15 years or more. And then Pitar bought the building and bought the, the restaurant out hmm, about 10, 15 years ago, something that way. And now, of course, it's uh, still called Pitar's, but it's run by someone else. But the cuisine was all much the same all through those years. Very good food there. Yeah. Used to make the best, uh, in fact, they still do, the best uh, Roquefort cheese dressing salad you ever tasted. <laughs> I love it. I do, too. And then uh, the building next door to that was the Central Bank which is now Lloyd's Bank. The Central Bank and Bank of California. It's been through it half a dozen hands and uh, First Western Bank and now Lloyd's Bank. Always in the same location. That was where no, Freddy's Pizza is. That's where Freddy's Pizza is now. That's that where was the bank. The bank was. And that was the, the only bank here. in Lafayette. Mm -hmm. All through the 40s. The on that was the only bank. Mm, I don't think the Bank of America came in here until the middle 50s, or something that way. Central Bank, was it a locally owned bank? Mm, I don't no. really know when we first came. I think that there was mm -hmm. a branch out of Oakland. Oakland. But uh, I don't really know who owned it, actually. May have been local people, because we often have banking people that live in Lafayette. In fact, we do right now. Yeah. And... Uh, then next to that, where the little Chinese restaurant is now, there was a bakery, a very good bakery, made excellent bread, and of course all the other things, pastries and all that sort of thing that bakeries make. Let's see, what was in the corner place there where the ice cream counter is now? I don't think that was there, Ted. This was that was on Maybe there. the bakery took the entire area. I don't remember what was where the ice cream place was. There was a house where the Associated Service Station is, or Phillips Service Station. A residence? A residence, yes. There was two elderly widow ladies that lived there. Really? I don't think we have a picture of that. Uh, Gosh, 
we have, uh, can you remember their names? Two sisters, you remember? The houses were either moved or torn down. There was three, I think, extending back up to about where the mortuary is now. And maybe it went clear through to that corner. I'm, I don't know the property lines in that area. But uh, the apartment that that's behind the service station was, there was a house there, and I'm sure there was a house above there, between there and the mortuary, but this is many years ago, and I've kind of forgotten. Yeah. Are we, uh, this is the early 50s, you'd say, was, the houses were still there in the early 50s? Yes, I, I'm sure they were there up to uh, 52 or 3, anyway. What was across the street, Ted, from you? If you were uh, looking out there, of your there was a store. vacant lot. Oh, you across the street yes, from me. From you, yes. As you would look out across to, uh, Miss, almost to see Mrs. Rosenberg's house, I guess. Oh yes, right. it was almost in direct vision. In fact, uh, I would see Bill or Mrs. Rosenberg come out of the house, and I'd walk out in front of the store and wave at them. It was just just like looking across here, uh, next to the Rosenbergs on the west side was Super Saver. Lois store, or Monty's store now, is the same type store that Super Saver was, a large store with a liquor department, big meat market. In fact, Jim Peterson, who now works for Diablo Foods, worked there. And uh, one, one of your neighbors here, uh, Mac something or other, lives right around there. McCluskey. McCluskey worked for Le Harold Levy, he owned the store. He ran the liquor department. I must record Mac someday because I didn't know that at all. And he lives just around the corner. And he and Zoe have been here a long time. Yeah. We'll have to. They were here when we came here. We'll have to ask them to tell us about um, their experiences in Lafayette too. And then next door to that was a child store, clothing and toys and uh, baby carriages and everything cribs everything goes with babies this was a big baby town at that time <laughs> <laughs> yes right after the war yeah <laughs> there, there was a baby boom i do remember that and then uh, further down the street was orchards where the shell service station was an orchard or in it yeah it was orchard yeah I think that had walnuts on it. And then across the street where the Associated Service Station is, that was, uh, had walnuts, little orchard, and had a little house in there that Reese Nedeker, the real estate lady here in Lafayette, she's still in business, I think. Well, it's very recent that she isn't, I don't know. But anyway, why, uh, she and her husband had their real estate office in this little house where the Texo service station is. The uh, next door where the uh, real estate office is now was uh, Coast County Gas Company. Mm -hmm. And PG&E now took them over so they have the gas. But this was a separate entity at that time owned by a group down at Santa Cruz called Coast County Gas Company. Do you know when they came into the area? They were here when we came. Mm -hmm. I know when P about when PG&E bought them out, that would be the early 50s sometime. Middle, early to middle 50s. Uh, next door, where the standard station is now, that was a service station. Across the street, coming down Mount Davila Boulevard towards Moraga Road, across Oakland, uh, there was a little orchard in there. On the back side of this orchard, across from where the city hall, the building where the city hall is now, the same house that's there now was there then. But there was a people living there, but they, they ran a nursery. Not the type nursery that's there now, but this was a nursery like orchard nursery up here where they had plants, flowers yeah. and plants and shrubs and all that type of thing. Their names was Wright. Wright's Nursery. Wright's Nursery, yeah, but what was his first name? 
Forget these things. I hadn't thought about them. And where the Lloyd's Bank is now was a vacant lot. And where uh, the Garabati building, as it's called, next to the Lloyd's Bank, before you get down to the Garrett building, that was all vacant lot, trees in it, I think orchard probably. And uh, Garrett building was there. That was, it had been there quite a number of years when we came. Did you it, know Mr. Garrett? Oh, Colonel yes, Garrett? very well. Would you, he, he was an interesting old fellow, I understand. He Tell us about him. He was a real character. What do you remember of him? Come in and kiss the girls. He, he always <laughs> came into the store and he kissed the girls. <laughs> I've heard about him, yes. <laughs> and uh, oh, God. they lived in Happy Valley. In fact, I think the property may still be in, in their name, although it may be sold now up about where the school is on Lower Happy Valley Road about mile and a half up the road or two miles. Uh, he was a big man. About Colonel Garrett was a big man, around six feet or a little over, weighing 250 pounds or more, very florid complexion. He not only was a big man physically, but he was a big man mentally and in his ideas. Yes, he I've built heard about that, that beautiful brick building, put a slate roof on it, and it probably stay there for a thousand years. Yes, it's a handsome building. And he tried so desperately to get the other landowners in that area to continue that so that Lafayette would have a like uh, Carmel and that type of thing on the main street, Mount Babylon Boulevard in Lafayette. But no one had the vision to do that. No, that reminds me, I, I would like you to describe the um, type of, what, what did it look like? Uh, what did Mount Diablo Boulevard look like? Well, you see in the pictures that you have in your files, of Mount Diablo Boulevard about 1920s. It didn't look too much different from that. Where the Stanley Building is now was a, I'm sorry, where the George's is now. There was the post office. In other words, the, the architecture was helter-skelter. There was no unity. No unity at all. It was just a shame because had they, the people had vision and followed the ideas that Colonel Garrett had, Lafayette would be a quaint, unique town, so different from what it is. Well, it's getting better now. I think so too. But uh, so different from what it developed into through the years before it began getting better. All this clutter of signs and everything we used to have. Weren't they awful? Yes. And the wires and just everything is so much better now. Used to look down the street from our store, walk out to the curbside there, and there was no sidewalk there, just walk out into the oil road or gravel on the edge, and look down the street, and it was just a mass of wires and old dilapidated buildings. The, uh, where the Stanley building is now, it was owned by Mr. Stanley at that time, was Mr. Sparling had his pharmacy, a drugstore his was, because he was mostly merchandise, yeah. much like your long drugstores or Payless or that type of store. Had a fountain in there and coffee and sandwiches, even those days. Uh, the building was terribly dilapidated. No. Roundup building was there, a little more dilapidated, needed paint very badly. They painted it in the meantime. It looks so much better now that way. And further down, on the corner of, uh, what's that street there? Huff. Huff. On the corner of Huff, where the clothing store is now, was, uh, Richard's drugstore. Little narrow space there, about 
12 feet wide and extended back to the back part of the building. And next to that was the emporium, clothing, women's and men's clothing and shoes and all that type of thing. Very nice merchandise. The people who operated that, Fredman's, still live in Lafayette. Hmm. They, they took the next two spaces and then uh, Diamond Dollar. Diamond Dollar was where the uh, where the foods health, food, health store food store is now. That was run by Ken Jensen, not Ken Jensen at that time. He bought it from the other man. Who was it that ran that? Gosh. Can't remember. I can find out for you though on these things. Uh, next door to that was. A saloon looked much like it does now, except they put a new front on it, which improved it tremendously. Shillelagh. Shillelagh, yes. And then next door to that was the barber shop, like it is now. He, that man was there when we came here. And next door to that was an open lot with a square house in the center of it. And you have a picture of that house. Yes, we do, in our files. In your files. I've seen it. And a German couple, man and wife, ran a nice little short order eating house in there. And they served German type food. On uh, certain days of the week, they would have sauerkraut and, and sausage, corned beef. corn beef and cabbage, other times, and ribs, beef ribs. You remember those roasted beef ribs they used to have? She was a wonderful cook. He still lives here. His wife died a number of years ago. Very nice couple. What they, did you say his name was? I don't remember their names. Mm, I'll have to think on that. I know it. I can t take you to his house. <laughs> <laughs> he lives up, uh, you know where the laundromat is? Behind there. He owns that property. Well, maybe you can give me a call if you think of it. Well. Uh, these things that uh, I tell you that I can find out for you, you let me know. All right. And uh, make a list of them. You don't need to call me. Just drop me a note in the mail, and I'll check them out for you because it's okay. awfully so difficult to remember yes, back. Yes, of course, things because like I'm that. asking you off the top of your head and haven't asked, and we wouldn't, didn't didn't. Uh, Where the new bank before. is on the corner of Moraga Road, that obnoxious-looking building, was... Uh, Associated Service Station, ran by Ed Carey's brother. Uh, across the street, the Union Service Station was there, and the plaza was still there, not nearly as nice as it looks now, where the uh, wheel people are, the handlebars or bicycle people. That was a grocery store and meat market. Where the restaurant is on the corner, of Golden Gateway and Moraga. That was an open lot. The building looked just like it did in the pictures, excepting that it had this front and you could see the side. You know the picture you have where it's taken at the angle? Yes, yeah, so you can see the roof line of yeah, the Pioneer store. You could store. see that. And then uh, next door to that, Dolly uh, Coleman. Coleman had a little dress shop cleaning and dress, cleaning establishment, and uh, she did dressmaking and uh, repair work on clothing that needed Alteration. alterations. <coughs> and uh, next door to that was somebody, the people that lived there on the corner. Meadow. Meadow. They were there. That was their home. And still is the home of Mrs. Meadow. She lives upstairs yeah. now. But okay. those days, they, they, the whole house was their home. They did not rent it out. And in next there, there's a relative of theirs, but I can't tell you who it is. It's that same family owned a piece of property in there where that little restaurant is now. I don't remember a restaurant being there at that time or a barber shop. Or, there was a beauty shop in there. Used to go to it. Sister, the girl that worked for Dr. Filer. Yeah, what was her name? Operated a beauty shop. Mm. About where that little, what is it, Myrtle's little restaurant is there, close to the theater. 
the theater was there it looked very much the same as it does now across the street was uh, Union service station the uh, highway was not there like it is now that hill came down across remember when the, they put in the shopping center there plaza shopping yes. center we just they tore down the hill. Cut down that whole hill. Well, the road went through before, but it wasn't it piles of dirt on both sides. They just cut through, and it was like going down a canyon of a sort, high on both sides, uh, where uh, the Ford people are. That was a, a knob there that must have been 50 feet high. Remember the old Knight Templar Hall? That you I'm have a sorry, I on? didn't remember, don't remember it, but it I... It was on that hill. It was on the hill. We have photographs of it. I sure we have. And it's a shame that the little uh, Templar Hall was removed because it was a charming building. Well, would you s when would you say the biggest uh, period of change came from Mount Diablo Boulevard and Lafayette, Lafayette Business mm, District? In the 50s didn't change too much up to 1950 as I remember there probably was some changes going on uh, to go back to the associated service station come down the other side of the street uh, the where the restaurant is now was not there where the flower shop and cleaners is that the narrow part of that was not there, but where the cleaners is, Jim Sherry had his men's furniture or er, clothing store. And then later he moved across the street in the new Garibaldi building, and uh, the cleaners went in. Uh, where the uh, delicatessen and television is now, that was a, a grocery store. Mm. It is run by Al Mortera and uh, his brother. I can't give you the That's brother's right. name. Brother still lives here. Dead, I think they still. Saw him not too long ago. Uh, beyond that was this. Uh, you told the name of Mort, not Mortera, but uh, Molino. Oh, Molino. Molino had a nightclub, a two-story building. There was nothing between, like where the Christian Science reading room is and the liquor store. That building was not in there. There was a couple of old shacks in there, just really shacks, I'll tell you. And I think one of them had a cleaning establishment, and I can't remember just what was in them. And then was this two-story building, and Molino was mixed up with the the gambling interest. Oh, tell us about that. We've heard rumors about uh, uh, the gambling interests coming into Lafayette. Well, this was a was it a, was it a pretty good uh, true story? Was it a was it a true story? It is absolutely true. I am not a gambler. I never gambled, but I knew Joe Molina real well, and uh, I was across at the post office, which is across the street in this two-story building, one night, and somebody had forgotten to pull the blind down. And I could see him sitting around card table playing cards. And they got by with it. And, and they got the by with that. Hmm. Forbidden, I won't say who the sheriff then. <laughs> 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 but anyway, why, uh, it was an actual gambling place. Downstairs, Molina ran a very good Italian restaurant. We ate there many a time. You'd see these people come up in these big cars, and they had a side entrance and the stairway that went up. I don't know whether you have a picture of that or not. I don't remember seeing one anyway. I think that uh, Eleanor Myers may have given us a picture of that store. Could I'll be. have to check and see. It, it wasn't a store, it was a well, restaurant. Well, restaurant, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And it, across the street, that would be Oak Hill was Mrs. Van Meter's house, the old yes. lady, that is, she yes. was quite an elderly lady by this time, We've had, had been uh, postmistress. Yes, we've heard uh, so many people talk about uh, Carrie Van Meter. What do you, you, you remember her too then? Yes, I do. Uh, she, she was uh, 
a very frail person, very nice, intelligent, good to talk to people. She and Mrs. Jenny Bickerstaff, Rosenberg, were very good friends, had been, I guess, all their lives. And to get those two together and hear the stories they could tell about what went on in this area, both just really wonderful. Linda knows. You knew them too, Linda? I just knew them. I knew Mrs. Mrs. Rosenberg much better than I did Carrie. See, Carrie lived quite a ways down the street, and like I say, she was a frail. She was pretty heavy set. Yeah, but she was frail. She wasn't well. Oh, yeah. Different she wasn't yeah. fat, but she was chunk chunky. But she wasn't well, and she couldn't walk up to where we are easily. Once in a while she would get up there or somebody would bring her up or something that way. I knew her quite well. Um, did you ever go inside her house? Perhaps once or twice. We used to deliver medicine there sometimes. What was it? Do you remember what it was like? Uh, the old-fashioned type ranch home type of, of building where you walked into, uh, I think you came into the living room and hallway went off and you could see doors down this hallway so you knew that there was bedrooms or something a two-story house gable roof beautiful uh, antiques and things that way she had and really I haven't any idea whatever happened to those I suppose that she probably had a family and the family inherited them quite possibly I I understand that she was rather a recluse, and so I'm interested to hear that uh, someone really went in, was invited in her home. Uh, well, I think we were making a, making delivery. a delivery there yes. sometime or other, and she asked, for well, you know, it's natural. Yes, to be asked in. To be asked in. Uh, mm -hmm. A very courteous person. Yes. Very nice. Uh, are there any other people in town at that, in, during the first 50s that you remembered particularly well? Oh, gosh. That may Dr. have influence that had some influence on the town, such as Colonel Garrett, for example. Uh, not too much mm -hmm. in influence. I mentioned uh, Marie Snedeker and her husband, the realtors. They were people who. Uh, Sandberg. Hmm? Colonel Sandberg. Oh. He's dead. Yeah, not Sandberg. What oh, was it? Sandberg, was it? Colonel Sandberg. Captain, uh, Captain Sandberg. Captain. Captain Sandberg, an old Scotsman. Yes, who was Captain Sandberg? He was a real estate man. I see. And he and his wife, when we first came here, operated a business across the street from where our store was, uh, just about where the pizza parlor is now. There was a two-story frame house, this old-time house. In fact, it was Mr. Rosenberg's uncle owned the place one time. Mm -hmm. In behind was a tank house. You know what that is? Where you yes, have to store water. Store water and a windmill to pump it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had their office in that building until the building was sold. And then they moved down over here where uh, about where Mountain Jacks is now. There was a little business area on or the freeway is actually the freeway took all this property, and uh, Rick's drive they Rick's drive-in was up on top of the knob there. But first, I want to go back and finish the Mont the Boulevard <laughs> uptown. All right, maybe we had better do that because Across I don't think we're going to have enough time. I want to ask you a few more questions. Uh, do you want to just hit a couple of the highlights because I want to? I have a couple of more questions I'd like you to to talk about uh, yes I, I wanted to tell you for sure about this little old one-story long rambling building that was across the street from where Moraga Road comes in Mount Abla Boulevard Safeway is on the property now their property and uh, the property of Mrs. Van Meter mm -hmm. is the property the Safeway is on but this is where the Safeway parking lot right directly across the street from where Moraga Road came in was this little low building and that was the building where, uh, 
Oh, the blacksmith. Thompson. Thompson? Yeah, that's where he had his shop. Mm -hmm. the, the picture that you folks have in your records is this building that I just spoke about. That's reason I want to be sure and tell you where it was. Was still there in the 50s? Yes. Still there in 47. I can't remember when they tore it out exactly. And they had, uh, that's where Carl Geske of the Lafayette Paint and Hardware, that's now in Lafayette Square, that's where he started in business, was in that building. And it's where Jim Cunningham, who has the big old tire shop up the street now, he started in business in that building. And they had this little blacksmith shop, and then they didn't have a little restaurant in there, Linda? Or was that later that they put that foot-long dog? When they first brought those out, mm -hmm. this young fellow opened up a restaurant in this building. Don't know how he ever got in there because the thing was full of termites and <laughs> certainly not sanitary. <laughs> and that pretty well takes care of, of Mount Davila Boulevard down to there, and then it went over the hill area and, that, and down where uh, Hinks had their store in that uh, two-story building there, sort of a arcade type. That was a Gillette people, J-E-L-L-E-T-T, -T, owned that building or built it. And they had a furniture store in there, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Much like uh, Bruner's, that type of thing, very high-grade furniture, really nice. And then the building where uh, Butler County have their auto agency, that building was there. These are all scattered along. All those buildings in between that I'm not mentioning were not there. And across the street where Don Young's Ford is, it was nothing there. In fact, that was a hill and where the uh, Taco Bell is and all those buildings through there, those were not there, all built in later. And you go on down towards the cemetery and uh, Friendship Gardens had just opened. That was brand new. People were just moving in there in 47 when we came here. The old, beautiful old home down in the back there, of course, that is, was there, I guess, for many, many years. Yes, we have fo a photograph mm -hmm. of I know you that have. lovely home mm -hmm. by the creek. That's right. And there was another one or two down in there, but most of those homes are all from that period on, from 47 on. Because I can remember the, the gates out the front there, and it was this Friendship Gardens on them, was brand new, mm -hmm. spank and dab new when we came here in 47. On down that side of the street, I don't think there was a building I can't remember of any buildings down there. Might have been uh, ranch houses and that yes, type of thing. Mostly open space. Mostly open space, orchards and that type of thing. And on the other side of the street from, uh, well, you know where the, the rental place is there now? Some people in Maine, Pingree, owned that building. They had a clothing store in this side of it and where the the left-hand side, there's two sections to it. They had a restaurant in there. Williamson. Williamson? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Williamson. I don't remember his first name. Nope. He had a little restaurant in there. Mm -hmm. And that's all there was on that side of that street, outside of some homes. Yes. In fact, I still see one or two of them. You get on the freeway, you see them sitting back in there. Yeah, so it was a long, typical strip that was ugly and sort of typical of uh, many uh, American towns of that period. Very definitely. Uh, would you say that, that um, what do you think of incorporation for the business district? Do you think it was good for business or bad for business? Well, I don't know that it hurt business very much either way because they've never established a business tax, at least not to my knowledge, at the time that I sold my business. They had not. And uh, they... We have no city tax. Uh, some of the things that the city council has done has created a big disturbance, and I can't say I approve of all of them, although I do approve of some of them. I think we all approve of no city tax, don't we? The city tax is very important to all of us, because if you live in a town where city taxes are, they have a habit of creeping up just like state tax and federal tax or county tax or anything else. One year you start out at a dollar, the next year it's a dollar and a half. And that can get expensive after a while. Uh, Do you think the, the town in general then 
uh, the beautification has come because of incorporation? No, the beautification is being worked on before. Uh, I would say almost 10 years before, because long in the 50s, you probably have seen the Aaron T. Green report on the beautification of Lafayette. That was... You're talking about the Green? Yes, Aaron T. Green, the famous architect. Uh, he was an uh, active partner with Frank Lloyd Wright in uh, his building the last 20 years or so of his life. In fact, he was working on the Marin uh, Civic Center when we, I say we, the Chamber of Commerce of Lafayette and the citizens here formed a group which gradually worked into the Lafayette Improvement Association a design project and various ramifications all came out of that, I'm sure. But the Chamber of Commerce was the uh, spark plug on that. It was really outside of the Rotary Club, which was new. When I came here in 47, it had just been formed a few months. The Chamber of Commerce was the speaking part of the city of Lafayette as that is the city as we see it now because before that they had nobody excepting individuals who knew the supervisors and I will say one thing the supervisors used to come around and talk with all the people we had meetings and uh, in fact I got so I knew several of them very well because they came through the business district once or twice a year and got your ideas on what you thought should be done to improve the city. The uh, big changes that, that I have seen since I have been here 30 years on Mount Avenue Boulevard I don't think would ever have completely taken place without being a city. For instance, I mentioned the signs earlier. If you don't have a city you can't handle that sort of thing. The county is not interested in that. Uh, your electrical wiring, so forth. That was all done through the city, basically. Uh, it was started before, that is, things are projected, and it would have come. We had to form the district first. And you should have heard all the difficulties we had in forming that first district. You remember the center strip ran from Cape Cod, where it ends at the present time on the west side, down to just past the uh, Moraga Road, about a half a block on the east side. And people were so used to coming down Mount Diablo and turning across to park in front of a business or some place they wanted to go, a restaurant or something. All these businessmen thought that it was going to mean the end of Lafayette. And I really, it never hurt my business a bit. And I had a blockade all the way along a half a block on each side of me. In fact, my business was improving all the time. So I think it was a good thing. And I would like to see more of it. They should form another district on the parts that are not paved and let those people take care of the middles of their street because those are the parts of town that don't look so good now. Yes, you're c I think there has been quite a bit of talk to form another district, but I'm not quite sure if it's gone through. Yes, they're talking about forming it from, where is it, Brown Avenue on down to uh, Release Valley Road or Release Station Road, I guess it is. Ted, uh, before we um, go any further, um, I wanted to make sure that um, as a, that you, uh, to get your opinions on uh, a couple of things. As a member of the Historical Society's Artifacts Committee, what were some of uh, your projects? Uh, See, I'm, I'm not very much of a projector, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, well, I do remember that you uh, told us you, were tr uh, you had heard that Elam Brown's mill wheel was covering a well in Happy Valley. And you were, did you ever have an occasion to check that out? We have one mill wheel in the Plaza Park, and the second mill wheel is lost somewhere. Uh, I really don't know about that. It could be, 
very well because I know that there are wells in Happy Valley. I've been told that. Uh, Mrs. Irene Bunker would probably have more knowledge about that than anybody else that you could contact, or maybe her daughter Betty. Betty Burke? Yeah, Betty Burke. They you live know, in Happy have, Valley. Um, we have uh, uh, done a tape recording of Mrs. Bunker not so very long ago, but I'm not sure that we asked that question. Perhaps that is one of the questions we could ask her. Yes, because she might know about that. Uh, who else would know? David Crossett, maybe? I don't know. I don't know where he is, if he's still mm -hmm. in Lafayette or not. His mother owned uh, on Thompson Road, up the Plaza Center, uh, not Plaza Center, the uh, Fiesta Center. You know that road going in there? All the Moraga is called Wilkinson, Wilkinson Lane. Lane. Yes. Well, his mother owned that white house it's right on the end of the parking, L parking there, next to the uh, the, the uh, bakery shop. Mm -hmm. Now, someone may know where he is, and he might know. Now, that's Mrs. Bunker's nephew. Well, we should follow up that on that.